So welcome everybody, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Krzysztof Kozłowski. If you don't know how to pronounce my name, you can go by Krzysztof. Uh, I work in Inaro in Qualcomm Landing Team. I'm also maintainer of device three bindings with Rob and Connor. I take care about several other things as well in the kernel, uh, Samsung Synos, memory controller drivers, and a few other things. Uh, what I'm going to talk here today. So I will introduce shortly what is device three source, what are device three sources, device three bindings. Maybe already you know it, then I will go fast through it. I will share why I'm working on the entire topic. Uh, I will describe the current progress, how we are with fixing of the validation errors coming from device three schema. And uh, I hope I will come with some conclusion whether the entire process is worth effort or it's not worth. So quick, quick recap, uh, the device three uh, itself is not tied for the, to the Linux kernel. However, due to my interest and uh, let's say my maintainership, I'm looking here from the point of view of the Linux kernel. The device tree itself describes the hardware, which is not non-discoverable for the platforms which need it in that way. So uh, for the firmware or OS, when there's no other discoverable method, so no, no ACPI. The DTS are the sources. Then the DTC, which is the compiler, takes the source, creates the DTB, and how you have the, uh, the blob. Now, how the bindings fit here. The bindings are the set of rules which describe how to write the DTS, and they also say they document the interface. They, what's important here, they don't document the driver, they rather document the interface, how the driver should use it, and for different implementations. Now, the device tree schema is something relatively new uh, in, in this entire uh, setup. So this is a new format of the bindings. The previous one was a text format, and this new format has several benefits. First of all, it can have it allows to validate the bindings against meta schema, so that the bindings are correct. And it allows to validate the DTS against the bindings. And this is what this talk is going to be about, mostly. Pictures worth thousands of words. So we have the device three bindings, which impose a set of rules on device three sources. Then the DTC compiler takes the DTS, creates the DTB. And now you have DT schema package, which is a Python package. And this DT schema takes the device three blob, so DTB, takes the bindings, takes the meta schema, and tells you whether everything is okay or not okay. Now entire device three sources and the bindings are in the Linux kernel repository in the, in the main branch. Uh, DTS is used by several platforms, and not only ARM64, ARM also MIMS, PowerPC, RX5. So at 6.8 kernel, uh, we had around 3,000 DTS files. Each DTS file corresponds to certain hardware board, usually around 2,200 DTSI files, so the include files, which can correspond to some reusable component like a SOC, SOM, or some shared part. We also have overlays files, which I will not be covering here. We have around almost 4,000 bindings in the DT schema format. And to recap that, uh, one binding file can cover multiple devices, so pretty often covers several different device types. And also SOC itself has so many devices that it contains, it's split to multiple uh, binding files. We still have around 1,500 uh, bindings in a text format, which will also impact the validation itself here. Now, why I'm working on this? So I work mostly on the upstreaming of a new SOC software for Qualcomm. And if you have a major platform and you upstream it, then you write quite a lot of DTS. And for example, the recent Qualcomm 8 again, Snapdragon, the, the third one, had a, around 13,000 lines of driver changes and bindings, and 8,000 lines of changes in the DTS. So around 40% is the DTS if you upstream a new SOC. And this doesn't include the PMIX, so the power management uh, ICs, which are entirely reused from the previous, uh, previous generation. If you have incorrect DTS, you might have quite tricky bugs to fix, because these are closer to the hardware-related bugs. And now the DT schema is the entire here, the concept which can help you to find the bugs in DTS up to some level, and this is what the talk is also about. Uh, during my spare time, I was maintaining, I'm still maintaining Samsung Exynos SOC, so this is entire spare time, and therefore I'm kind of here, uh, interested in optimizing my review time so that I want a tool which will help me reviewing and finding bugs, because no one pays for this, right? Uh, now I'm working for Inaro and I'm focusing on Qualcomm and uh, from the same reason I'm also, this is why I'm working on the Qualcomm on validating the DTS. Now, yeah. I started working on this uh, 
what, five years ago. So uh, that time I was uh, focusing on the Samsung Exynos platform. So the entire work starts with 5.3 kernel, and this number will be beginning of here several of uh, things which I'm measuring. And since 2022, I joined Linaro, so I do the same for the Qualcomm, and this work for looking for validation warnings is around uh, 5.18 kernel. So again, this number also will be quite important here. So what platforms here I measured and how I measured things. So first of all, the methodology. So I wanted to compare the validation of the DTS, of the device resources, against the bindings from several kernels, starting from 5.3. I actually measured much, much, much more, but there's no time to present all the data, so I chosen a few kernels up to 6.8, which was last released. The warnings itself and the validation comes from the DTC, the compiler, and the DT schema. Now, the problem, of course, is the bindings and the schema change with the kernels. Uh, the, we can compare, uh, convert some text bindings to the DT schema, so this is why the most recent kernel has the most bindings converted to DT schema. If you go to the 5.3, there, there was a lot, a lot of bindings still in text. Bindings can also grow, deprecated, get improved, uh, things like that, and the DT schema package also changes. So I remember that at some point I finished all the warnings for the Samsung Exynos, and then Rob Herring, another maintainer of device three bindings, he turned on some uh, additional warnings in DT schema. So even though the DT bindings and DTS are supposed to be stable over time, they can a bit change. And the entire point of my methodology here that I was testing all DTS with the new kernel and the, with the new binding. So I was using kind of new tools to test all DTS. So also I used the, used the newest DT schema uh, 2024.2. Now, which platforms I was testing? DTS is used on several platforms like Arc, MIPS, PowerPC, but no one, I think, work, okay, no, no, no one, not many people work there to fix the warnings, so this is kind of not, not much work happening. Risk Five is using DTS, and the uh, problem is that it's boring because everything is fixed. So I'm, I didn't include here Risk Five. So my interests are around Armor ARM64, uh, and because of limited time, I focus on certain just amount of platforms. So I tested several DEFCONF, DEFCONF things and collected warnings for these platforms. So for the ARM32 bit, I collected multi V7 warnings. So this is the config which covers all of the uh, ARM, uh, most of the ARM V7 uh, boards. Exynos and Qualcomm DEFCONF things which cover respective parts of the ARM32 bit uh, Qualcomm or Exynos. For ARM64, I also tested the DEFCONF which covers almost all ARM V8, V9, uh, ARM64 bit platforms. Exynos, which in that case covers a bit more, and uh, this covers Exynos OC, Tesla, and uh, Google uh, Tensor. These are all Exynos. And of course, Qualcomm, which covers the, the Qualcomm guys. I mentioned before that uh, we had around 2,900 DTS files, but I will not be testing all of them. Uh, I will not be collecting warnings from all of them. If you look at the DTB targets created by each of these def configs, so for the ARM Multi V7, so this kind of things which covers all of the 32-bit ARM, not all, most of them, this is uh, 1,300 boards, DTB targets. ARM64 def config has uh, around 1,000. So in total, we cover with this test 2,300 boards, which is not that bad. It's pretty nice coverage. And by the way, I'm, why I'm talking about DTB, because this is what the DTC compiler takes, and this is what the DTC schema evaluates, and this is what actually uh, maps towards the final board. So now a bit of history, let's look how many of these boards we had. So the chart shows here number of the DTS makefile targets, or DTB targets, over time. The axis at the bottom is the Linux kernel version, so starting from 5.3. The big red stuff is ARM Multi V7, and it grown by plus 43% up to 1,300 uh, boards. ARM64 the config grew plus 300%, so from 250 to almost 1,000 boards uh, from the oldest time. But a tremendous kind of change was here for the ARM Qualcomm. So ARM64 Qualcomm, 64B Qualcomm started in 5.3 with 15 boards, and now it's 236. And this is partially the answer why I call this topic entire like a walking mall. So the point is that it grows so much that the malls are uh, appearing faster than you can walk them. This chart will also appear a bit further because it also impacts uh, 
how whether we are able to actually solve the solve the warnings. And about the warnings, I mentioned that there are two types of them: DT schema and the DTC. So DTC are the warnings which are produced from the device -C compiler, and they are there since all time, so what, 10, 15 years or more, right? So we fixed all of them, right? This is actually a boring topic, but the problem is that we didn't fix uh, several of them for several boards. Uh, we, have, we still have many warnings, but if we didn't fix them, then it's actually, you know, done, boring. Uh, so I'll just show uh, here a few results very, very fast. And this chart shows the total number of, top, total number of warnings per uh, given the config. So the big red spike is the R multi V7, uh, which is absolutely huge, up to 5.18 kernel. I hid here some part, I will now show it again. So then at 6.2, it improved significantly. And this kind of almost zero there is ARM Exynos, which is, uh, which is nicely fixed because for both ARM Exynos 32 and 64 bit, these are fixed. Only a few remainings are moved to the different config. I mean, different uh, warning level. However, I mentioned that this is the previous chart, that we have many, many targets, right? So the Qualcomm grew significantly, multi V7 grew significantly, then ARM64 config as well, right? So the total number of warnings doesn't tell you that much. It just, you know, tells you that you have many, maybe make five targets, especially because one warning can appear multiple times. If the warning is the result of uh, error or something in the SOC DTSI file, so they include, it will appear multiple times. So the biggest platform, right, they will have the biggest amount of the warnings, and I don't want to punish active subsystems, so let's come with a bit different metric. So let's divide the number of warnings per number of targets in given kernel. And I'll be using this metric from now on to all further slides charts, so everything will be divided per number of targets. And if we look at the number of DTC warnings per target, it's getting a bit better. So still 32-bit uh, ARM stands out, and all others are kind of uh, nice next to each other. Uh, and with 6.8 kernel, the Exynos is done, and the Qualcomm is kind of on par on ev with the average. So, yeah, still there is a lot of work to improve here, but apparently no one works on this, right? So just a reminder, Exynos is good. But I want to speak about something here. <laughs> yeah, I'm selling here myself. Uh, I want to speak about the DT schema validation, which is the new way of, uh, let's say, looking at bugs in the device resources. So again, to, to recap, I'm testing DTS against the newest bindings every time. So all DTS, new bindings, a new DT schema. Uh, if the binding is not covered by the DT schema, so it's still in a text format, it will cause a warning. This is warning by itself. And there is such, let's see this number of uh, such undocumented or compatible, it's not in DT schema. So this is also divided per, ta per target. So R multi V7 has a lot of things which are still not converted. Uh, and several others are significantly better. And uh, for X, you know, I have, I think, one, one un, uh, undocumented compatible in that way. Now, if we look at the warnings itself, so, and the, probably the number, let's start with X. You know. So with 5.3, I had around 100 for ARM 64-bit Exynos and 80 warnings per target for ARM 32-bit Exynos. So this is a lot, right? Uh, it started getting better. So again, the bottom axis is the Linux kernel. The top axis, I mean, the uh, horizontal axis is the uh, vertical axis, is the number of warnings per target. And then on 5.18, I got really nice. And with 6.5, I'm done, so almost done. The only remaining one is because the binding is not converted to the text format. So it's possible to bring a platform to the zero warning stage. Now, with the Qualcomm, it started the same, right? So it also started with around 120 warnings for ARM64 and 80 for ARM uh, V7. Then uh, things got weird, so it's kind of, some things improve, some things uh, get worse. I would assume that much more hardware was added, and this is why uh, there was that spike. But it's also the point which I would really reworked really a lot and hard to bring down the warnings, and we slightly succeeded. I mean, we, we drove it really nice to the, up to the eight warnings per target for ARM64 Qualcomm. It's still not zero, so it's still not that good. If you want to see the chart and compare it with the average, so with the average, let's say, entire dev config for ARM v7 and ARM30, uh, ARM9. So 
this is the combination of these two charts, and here the R multi V7 and RM def config are also added, so we can compare it with the average. Long time ago, everything had a big, big, big spikes, and this is the weird spike of the Qualcomm. With 6.2, we are getting better, better, and with 6.8, we are here. So the thing which are kind of the colors which you can focus on is the green, which is RM64 def config. So the average for RM64 is worse than the Qualcomm, and the same kind of for the RM32 bit Qualcomm. So RM32 multi V7 has still a lot of warnings, but most of them are coming from compatibles not converted to DT schema. So why entire talk is uh, Wacamole, right? Uh, this is the recap, these are the numbers from the previous one. So we started for, with 5.3 kernel, with around 80 warnings per each of these platforms, per target, make five target, and around 100 or 120 for ARM, Exynos, and Qualcomm. And here the average actually was better, so ARM64 dev config had much less war, uh, warnings per target. With 6.8, we are partially there, but not really. So why working mole? Uh, this is the, you know, the working mole is like a game where the moles pop up and you have to whack them. I don't know why people hate moles. These are amazing animals, right? <laughs> so this chart shows a uh, number of targets and number of warnings. So the blue one is number of targets, which is for Qualcomm, uh, it's only for Qualcomm. And the red one is number of, number of warnings, total warnings. So we can see that both lines go somewhere, so number of, of targets, numbers of supported hardware grow slowly. Uh, luckily, number of warnings gets down faster, and this simple production would tell that around 6.11 we would reach zero warnings. I'm not sure if this is exactly true. Uh, more on that later. So, why this is fucking moles? Uh, some platforms are warning-free, so you can reach such warning-free stage, right? It's possible, but for some, it's very difficult. So there was a huge effort for the ARM Qualcomm to bring it down, and this effort still did not succeed. We are somewhere, but not there. Uh, and still, this is, of course, average per ARM64 Qualcomm, because if you look at the newest uh, ARM64 Qualcomms, there are just few warnings for them. So the Snapdragon 8 Gen and the uh, X Lite, they have only a few warnings. So we actually talk about here the legacy code, like uh, old stuff. And the problem is that this old stuff is also growing and being improved, and we are not able to fix it like uh, up down to zero. Now, is the effort worthwhile? So what does it give us? First of all, why are we fixing warnings? The trivial answer is that uh, we fix them because the tool prints them. So this is why we have to fix them, but complicated, it's a bit more complicated, and I will try to evaluate them and uh, figure out whether the warning is worth to fix. It's quite difficult to judge whether the warning itself is important or not. If you look only at the warning, so these are two examples of warnings, and they both say that some property for some node, so WR act, does not match any of the regexes, or power supplies does not match any of the regexes. So this is the weird way how DT schema tells you that property is not allowed. And what does it tell you? I mean, basically nothing, right? You don't know. The property should not be there, but does it mean that it's redundant, it's not needed? Or maybe it means that there will be, should be different property, there was just a typo or some uh, wrong name, and this different property is not required, but for this board, it, would, it should be there. Therefore, judging by warnings is quite tricky to say whether it's usable, useful or not. Therefore, I would like to rather ask a person who investigated the warning and fixed the warning. So I would like to look at the commit message. And hopefully all contributors write useful commit messages, right? So hopefully everyone who contributes to Linux kernel sends, say that why they are doing things. Obviously not. People say that this patch adds. Uh, so a little digression, if you ever contribute to Linux kernel, please always say why you are doing things, like you are fixing bugs of missing something in donkey drawer stuff, you are adding donkey drawer, or you are correcting the address of donkey drawer, or you fix a warning, and here goes the warning. From time to time, it's useful to say what you are doing if it's not obvious, but usually uh, we don't know why you are doing things. So my kind of research here uh, was about, I looked at all the comments which were touching DTS, tried to figure out 
whether they are the result of GT schema warnings and then classify this kind of sort of work on the GT schema warnings. However, uh, I looked only at the Samsung Exynos and Qualcomm platforms because of not enough of time. So if I look at the commits at Samsung Exynos, then uh, from the time I was working on the Samsung Exynos to improve it, this would be like a 370 commits for 32-bit uh, Samsung and 144 64-bit. So if I have 500 commits to analyze. For Qualcomm, I was working a bit later, so only 5.18, so the last 10 kernels, and there we have 500 commits for ARM32-bit and 2,500 commits for uh, RM64 and to analyze and to figure out whether the commit is useful or not. I mean, that the warning is useful or not. So in total, we have 3,500 commits just for Exynos and Qualcomm. And this is also the answer why I'm not looking at other platforms like Mediatek or uh, TI. Sorry, guys, I mean, not enough of time. Why I'm only looking at DTS? Uh, mostly because the DT schema finds issues in your device resources. So mostly the DTS is the problem here. It's true that device tree schema could point an issue which is after investigation and uh, an issue in the binding and in the driver. But, so, and this is like a really issue which we have to fix in the driver. However, uh, not enough of time. I mean, to find such comments, it will be much, 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 much work, especially if people say what they are doing, not why they are doing. So mostly here is uh, not enough of time. So, of course, someone could say that <laughs> you could, I could put this 3,500 commits to chat GPT, right, and just go buy NVIDIA stock. It's a great time to buy, buy high, sell low. Uh, so, instead of, I use more advanced technique called grep, and I was looking at the commit messages and trying to figure out whether the commit message is the result of DT schema validation. So, I was looking for DTBs checks, certain keywords, also for fixes and CC stable, because this also points that something was fixing in the past. And this kind of identified me the candidates for the commits, which are result of DT schema. And then I look at these commits, trying to figure out what they are doing, whether they are fixing real back or they are fixing possible or just a style because whatever, right? So again, thanks to all contributors who uh, said why they are doing things, not what they are doing. So I try to classify first all the commits which are the result of DT schema and this usually means that the committer knew that the DT schema uh, points to, the, to this issue, right? So mostly you know that there's some warnings and you are fixing the warning, but not always. Sometimes the, of course, committer said that what the patch is doing, but sometimes the committer actually said that there is a kind of, he described the bigger picture and probably I missed such, such uh, commits. So here there's a quite big, let's say, error rating on my research. So in other words, I try to find, identify and find all the comments which were the result of DT schema and then classify them. Why I'm doing this again? Because if DT schema finds real issues, then DT schema is awesome. If DT schema finds just, you know, code style and looking things, then yeah. So the classification. Uh, I divided the commits or the issues to five groups. Uh, one is like a style issue. So something which is purely to make the DT schema happy. This could be like a some uh, node name change. Something which could be improvement, so better hardware description. DTS describes the hardware, so we want to have better hardware description, maybe deprecated properties, I mean, use proper property, but still DTS is correct here. And then a possible fix, which means that probably Linux kernel works perfectly fine, but other user of DTS could be affected. There are other projects which use DTS, like Ubud, and the DTS is actually not correct, even though there's no issue identified. Real fix, so something does not work or should not work, so this is really uh, something which should be fixed. And I identified, by the way, a few things which were not pointed by DT schema, but they should be. I mean, uh, we are not there yet, so a uh, few things which would be a future fix. I understand this classification is subjective and things, uh, I based it on the commit messages and on the patch itself. So something which could be a style, could be improvement, a possible fix could be improvement or vice versa, and really issues could be a possible fix or again, vice versa, right? So this is, you know, quite subjective uh, judgment based on, on, on my work. It's even trickier with the, uh, with the comments which are changing multiple things in one place. Actually, it was easier with Samsung Exynos because I was 
mostly don't need the one contributor there. <laughs> it's significantly easier. I know what I'm doing, but in the Qualcomm, it's a bit trickier. Several people were writing that uh, they are doing something because of the bindings tell it, right? So yeah, this is quite, not sure why exactly, whether this is really things or not. So in the slides, I have a lot of examples of this, uh, of this classification and uh, how I did classify it, but I'm not going to describe it here because we don't have time for it. So if you are interested, you can go back to the slides which I will post on the, on the website. If you are interested in the future fix, so something which uh, was not reported by DT schema, but will be, I mean, I hope it will be reported by DT schema. It looks like this. So basically the P handle had an argument and it should not have an argument. And this caused the Linux driver to fail to probe. This is very simple stuff, but this additional p-handle confused the Linux driver and the driver was actually not working. GT schema does not find it yet, but it might. We are nice on track, so let's go to the results. So to recap, again, a number of DTS commits, a number of commits which were touching given platform, around 500 for ARM 32 bit, uh, for Exynos, 32 and 64 bit, and 3000 for Qualcomm, right? And commits which were result of GT schema validation. So the commits which are to fix a GT schema validation, which I figured out by my grapping, was around 40% for the 32 bit Exynos, 33 for ARM 64, and up to 22%, so up to 500, around 550 commits for ARM 64 Qualcomm were the result of GT schema validation out of 2,500. Now, what is the result of this classification of the commit per each group? So for ARM Exynos, we had 370 total commits and 70 of them is, uh, let's say, style. But I identified around 15 real fixes and 15 possible fixes and the six future fixes. And if I'm actually looking at 6.9 kernel, I would raise this number to 18 real fixes because I found there one more thing to fix. Uh, the bars are very similar for ARM 64 Exynos. The ARM 32-bit Qualcomm is a bit different, but the most interesting for me is the ARM 64-bit uh, Qualcomm. So here, around 60 issues were the real, fix, real fixes. So something which was supposedly not working, really not working, or might really not work for other uh, user, which we are interested that, you know, bindings and ETS should be portable. These are the total numbers, uh, but I would like to rather look at the percentages. So, so here, the 100% are all of the commits which are result of DT schema validation. So for the Exynos 32-bit, it would be 150 commits, right? So 100% is not all DTS commits, but 100% are the DT schema validation result commits. So around 50% of the commits were style-related and 10% were real fixes. This number would be a bit uh, higher if you include this future fix to this one. Similar numbers are for the 64-bit Exynos. So again, 10% are real fixes. The 32-bit Qualcomm is a bit uh, odd here, a lot of improvements at least, according to my eye. And for 64-bit Qualcomm, around 12% of uh, things which DT schema points are the uh, real issues. So let, it, let me drink. So to recap, around 50% of the things which DT schema points are kind of cosmetic style changes. And this is the effect how DT schema works because DT schema is quite strict on certain patterns in your DTS. This, by the way, is quite helpful because it improves the quality of DTS. Such DTS is usually easier to read, so easier to review, easier to maintain. If you want to fix all the DT schema warnings, you have to fix this 50% of the style related issues because this is the noise and you want to reduce this noise to actually get to the proper warnings. 30% are around some sort of code improvements, some, some better DTS to uh, better hardware representation DTS, or for example, removing deprecated properties, which is also useful if you want to maintain your DTS. And uh, around 10% are possible fixes. So something which could be for other project, like you boot other consumer of device resources. And 10% are, uh, are the real issues or real bugs. So this is quite good, I think. I mean, 
So I don't know what numbers did you expect. Uh, so you have a tool which in some automated way can improve your uh, DTS. It can find you to make it more readable, improve the code and find 10% of read bugs in your code. So this is why it's nice to use DT schema. And the final also conclusion is that it's possible to get the platform to warning free state. It's really nice uh, to have, I mean, it's really doable. Just find a dedicated person and you need to find the platform which grows very slow because the Samsung Exynos is basically stalled. So there's not much development there happening. Therefore, it's easy. For the other platforms, especially like Qualcomm, which grows significantly 1,500% more, right? Over the, the last, uh, what, five years? So for such platforms, it's quite tricky because the moles are uh, popping up faster than you can squash them, but we might get there at 6.11 kernel or somewhere there. That's it from the slides. Uh, thank you. So I will leave it here and maybe you have some questions. Thank you for the great talk. So does DT uh, schema validation also work for YAML-based uh, device tree files? So the uh, DT schema validation uses the YAML as the, the language to write. So the YAML is the, uh, the main kind of point there, but it's only the language how you write the, the binding. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, can you pass the microphone? So two questions. Um, the YAML files that are in documentation device tree, are is that basically the schema or is that separate from the kernel sources? Uh, so the DT schema as a core tool which performs this is separate Python package. And this separate Python package contains something which is called meta schema, which describes how the entire bindings in the schema should be written and the actual tool which performs the work. Now, in the kernel, you'll have all the bindings. So all the bindings are then also, we call them that, written in DT schema format uh, in YAML language. So we usually call it uh, like this the same word, like a synonym. But the actual tool is a Python package DT schema. I see, okay. So I'm wondering like to per possibly prevent the whack-a-mole you describe, if this were to be moved in the kernel sources and maybe checkpatch.pl could automatically run it, you know, for developers right away. So that, oh, my commit just introduced a new schema violation. Maybe I should do that. I don't know. What would be the overhead of that? Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Uh, and we have certain bots on the mailing list which test and report. I think that the problem here that it's quite still a lot of uh, noise around. So for example, if you add a new hardware for let's say some TI processor or Qualcomm processor, right? Uh, and you just add the board. So you reuse existing DTSI with the SOC. And this DTSI has some uh, errors that they will pop up for your board as well, right? So you have quite a lot of noise, which is not your fault is the, because we didn't fix the existing platform. So this is why this probably could not be enabled by default, but for some platforms it could work. So for now, you should do it kind of manually before you submit the patches. Okay, thanks. I think, uh, sorry for that, there is the person waiting. Yeah, thanks for the talk. So validation is always a great thing. Um, are there any efforts planned to do similar things for the uh, compilation with symbol information? Like currently we have the problem that there are many boards where you have overlays, but they are not compiled with the symbol information. So technically you cannot apply these overlays. And then the developer, first the board is added without this minus add, and then later on it's by another guy, the add is added, but it's not very consistent. So is there any plans to improve that as well? So the policy, if I understood correctly, the, the policy is that the overlay should be also the target. So overlay should be always uh, applied to the, base DTS, in the, if the overlay, of course, is in the Linux kernel. Therefore, it should be tested as well. And you, you mentioned that several of existing overlays are not like this, uh, and we kind of, I don't know, people convert them. But if you want to add a new overlay, this should be added in a way that it will be built and applied. So it will be therefore validated. 
Okay, thanks. I think you had a question. Thank you. Um, should the should the schemas be updated only by the uh, the people who write the drivers? Uh, asking because I've noticed some vendors have schemas that are too open ended, and you see different types of styles basically passing um, through and still giving us you know driver level errors. Um, so they're not as diligent with uh, the schema side as much as they are with the DTS side and the driver side. Um, so should we go in and try to fix the schemas for them? without knowing the long-term intention of their drivers or what their architecture is, or should we just leave it? I would say yes. I mean, if you see that the binding, so for example, uh, one way to, to improve situation is to convert existing bindings from a text to the DT schema format, so to the YAML, right? And this can be done by anyone. I mean, you don't have to know the hardware, of course. You can make some mistakes, but then someone else can fix it, right? You know, it's open source. Uh, in, and in theory also the device chip bindings themselves and the DTS they describe the hardware, not the driver. Therefore I could just also imagine that the driver author will write the bindings for the driver, which is not what exactly we want. We want the bindings and DTS to represent the hardware. Therefore you, you can decouple them. So the answer is that not only the driver author should uh, write the bindings. Thank you. And uh, more questions, hands up. Yeah, no. okay. I will get there. Okay. Sure. I, I was just going to comment on the whole check patch enabling type thing is, you know, I've certainly run the DT schema testing stuff, and I, I always find myself a little hesitant before sending a patch to run it because it's such a pain, right? Like, it's, I know it's important, but I find myself sometimes sending a patch that touches device tree up and then relying on Rob's bot to tell me that I screwed up rather than doing it ahead of time. And I feel a little stupid for doing it, but it's, it's because it's so heavy. And I wonder if the quality of patches posted and the number of things that slipped through would reduce by quite a bit if it was a lighter thing, right? Like if somehow there was a tool that you could, even if you, it was slow, but you could just run it and say, how many new warnings were introduced by my patch? That's hard to answer right now. And it's a lot of work that everyone needs to figure out how to do themselves. And if that could be easier, that'd be awesome. So. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> not, not, I mean, I'm not, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe everyone knows that. I'm just like, I, I was just sort of bringing it up and, you know, I'm not volunteering to do the work myself at oh. this point. Yeah, I know. Um, but, you know, it, it would certainly help. So I guess entire Canada has the same problem of uh, lack of automation tools. Uh, so that there's a lot of manual workflow. There are bots running, scanning mailing list, telling you that they run something, but this should be done with simple command on your end, for example, or you push something to some uh, Git forge, which does everything for you, right? But because it's distributed uh, open source project, then no one is the owner, no one runs it. So, yeah. Can you pass the mic? Uh, maybe there further. Oh, yeah. Um, if someone wants to get their hands dirty and start whacking some moles, uh, do you have any advice where to get started with this? Oh, sure. Uh, so one easy task is to convert existing text bindings to the device tree schema. And from this task, please always choose a, a binding, so the text, which has a in-kernel DTS. So because there are some bindings which uh, have a driver, well, usually that's obvious, but they don't have a DTS inside the kernel. Uh, and such case is kind of less important, so the, the easy task would be to, uh, to work on the uh, text binding. And then, of course, while you convert it to the DT schema, you can run the validation on this DTS, and maybe it will point you to some issues. And second thing is probably you should avoid the most active platform. So, for example, for the, I mean, so I would be happy if you had Qualcomm, right? However, uh, there's a lot of work uh, happening in the Qualcomm, and if you are not into this uh, process, then it might be a bit tricky for you. But there are many, many, many platforms which are kind of abandoned a bit, and you can just send warnings to, I mean, fixes for the warnings there, for the validation errors, and this would be welcomed, no problem. Uh, of course, always there's a problem with the testing, so because you don't have the hardware. However, several issues pointed by the DT schema, as I 
mentioned, they have very little impact on the working. They are kind of style and improvements. So I did hundreds of patches which I didn't ever test except compilation and stuff. And they should be logically correct, right? So such work is an uh, easy way to get into the kernel, sub, uh, kernel process contributing. Thank you. And hands here. Can you pass the mic so I'll be less jogging? Yeah, thank you for uh, your work on this. And uh, one thing I want to add uh, for the DT schema testing is, uh, yeah, I was extremely annoyed by having it running by hand. So in the end, I started using uh, GitHub and uh, just wired uh, the validation there after every push. And it works nicely. I Just one thing which annoyed me a lot is uh, showing the unconverted um, text files in the YAML, so like you, you don't have the schema. So at least for ARM 32-bit devices, it helped a lot uh, to just grab these out and just verify at least what has the YAML schemes. So I could like easily see if I have green or red pipeline, depending on, uh, you know, if something changed with new next kernel. So if anyone wants GitHub uh, files, ping me. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, I know that in the kernel there is already a CI file for a GitLab, so that for some projects it's possible to have, let's say, some GitLab uh, pipeline. And maybe if we move it, add something like this too, uh, for, because GitLab is a bit more preferred here because you could run your own instance in the case of GitLab, you cannot. So if someone contributes something like this uh, to the kernel and then you, anyone could plug it to their own GitLab repo, then maybe this would solve for the active contributors. It will, of course, not solve all the drive by people who need something done by someone else, but this is a nice idea. It, it was really useful for merge request because uh, like for post-market OS where people trying to mainline new phones and tablets and stuff, they often are very newbies and they do a lot of mistakes. But this was very nicely catching like each new mistake they introduced the existing like, let's say still missing YAML files, but not uh, having mistakes in existing validation. Great, yeah, sounds Thanks. good. And more hands up, yeah, one there. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, you're just mentioning this for Linux, but uh, does this schema validation also applies to UBoot? Because when I think of initiatives like um, ARM System Ready, it will be, in my opinion, it will be more important for UBoot because it passes the actual DDB to uh, the Linux kernel. Is, is there support for UBoot on this? So that's an awesome question. And I invite you to the talk by Sumit Garg, uh, which is later, I don't remember which exact date, because there's an ongoing work to use the uh, device tree bindings from the kernel and device tree sources from the kernel directly into the U-boot. So basically there will be, uh, we export the bindings and DTS from the kernel at some point, like a new release, and take entire package as a whole to the U-boot. So then maybe you wouldn't need to run the a validation on the U-boot side, because validation is done on the kernel, right? But if you reuse everything from the kernel, then you actually, uh, you know, you have the, the same errors or the same lack of errors. So I think that the solution to, to your case would be to switch to the in-kernel DTS and in-kernel bindings. And this is what uh, Sumit's talk is about. So uh, please figure, find where so, so the ground truth of the DTS will be the kernel? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So any ideas here to move the DTS and the device tree bindings out of the kernel are usually rejected for the main reason is that if we move it out, no one will ever review it. I mean, because, uh, and this is even visible because the, the package DT schema is the Python package, which is outside on, on GitHub repo. And it also contains some kind of core bindings for the core, let's say I2C, for SPI, things like that, right? They're also there. And the maintainers of the I2C don't look there because, I mean, they are not used to look there. They're used at the Linux kernel mailing list. So this is the big risk here is if we ever split it out of the kernel, the scope of the review of interested people will kind of significantly reduce. So probably the source of the knowledge will be always the kernel. Oh yeah, tomorrow 9.55 a.m. the summit talk about uh, using uh, GTS on the kernel. 
Can you pass the mic? Um, is there any talk about getting Zephyr or FreeBSD to use the same DT? <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> okay. But this would be also a nice topic. I was always uh, surprised to figure out that uh, Zephyr went also with the YAML format, but entirely different and uh, its own way. And Okay, I guess that's it. Thank you for coming, and I will be there in the zone. So if someone wants to say hi, put face to a name, and shake hand, then I'll be happy. Thanks.